Between follow-up surgeries, I had started recording what has become the Voice Club Academy training. Developing the system that I wanted to make sure was in place in case something did happen to me so that singers would have access to the opportunity to learn what would probably never replicate itself again. At that point, I was the only person in written history that had ever recovered a fully normal voice after a severe vocal dysphonia. But I had not only recovered a fully normal voice, I had actually recovered my full usable professional level voice, which was something that everybody told me was not possible. Then I went in for my last surgery and I talked to the anesthesiologist like I always do and I have this little conversation and I said, my voice is my work. I understand a little bit about the anatomy of the voice. I've had vocal damage because of XYZ. I just want to ask you, would you do it just as a personal favor for me? Would you use a small tube when you intubate me? It would just make me feel better because I've got small internal parts according to my doctors and I wanted to make sure nothing else hurt. And he smiled and he said, of course I will, of course I will, but he didn't. And during that follow-up surgery, he used a larger tube that he was more comfortable with using like most of them do. And because he had trouble getting it down my throat, he ended up directing the tube in a way that sliced through my entire right vocal cord and the entire right vocal muscle. A clean, severed muscle. I was devastated to wake up and not be able to talk again. So off to more specialists. Now at this time in my life, I still had access to my extremely expensive vocal coach who was leading a world organization and, and doing vocal repair is one of the things that they really do because it's the only organization that really started from the science, so they have the ability to do some of that. And I went straight through to the top and I said, all right, this is what you do. Here's what happened. This should be an easy fix because you know what happened. You know what's wrong. Unlike vocal dysphonia, which is everything else is attacking your vocal machine and trying to shut it down, it's just a clean slice. We could fix that, right? And I remember in the video call, my coach explaining to me that there was literally no precedent in everything they understood about the voice to even know where to begin, to even make that a possibility, to ever recover my voice. And I know he felt really bad about it because he got me in to see the world's number one singer's vocal surgeon at Beverly Hills. And I know Broadway singers that cannot get in with this guy. This guy has healed and helped and recovered the voices of so many platinum recording artists through decades uh, that all of his exam rooms are filled with autographed platinum albums. The ceiling and the walls, all of the rooms are full of them and he said he's got storage places full of them. There are only two vocal surgeons in the world that specialize in singers that really know what they're doing. We've got one in New York, we've got one in Beverly Hills. We're very blessed in the U.S. And my doctor in Beverly Hills, Dr. Nassari, also teaches at Harvard to teach up-and-coming surgeons the difference between the speaking voice and the singing voice. I learned so much that I never knew about the medical state of things when it comes to doctors and singers during this stage. I know that you have a probably less than 1% chance of knowing what doctor you need to go to when you're concerned about your voice because I was a professional and I had access to everything and I had no clue. Nobody was telling me. I was working with an organization that did vocal repair and they couldn't tell me. And outside of this number one singer surgeon who nobody could get in to see, they couldn't even tell me where to start. But here's what I learned that is super important. An ENT, ear, nose and throat doctor, knows nothing because he studies nothing and is required to know nothing about really the vocal cords, the vocal machine. He knows the basic anatomy. Every time I would go to another specialist, I would explain my voice is my living. I have to use it as a high level. And they just glazed over. No clue what that meant, how to even use that information to change the way they did anything. The next stage of doctor is an otolaryngologist, which just means a guy that specializes in the voice box and the stuff that's in the voice box. And when I got to otolaryngologists, which I went to several, I thought, great, I've got the guy who's studied everything. He can tell me so much. It was not true because the otolaryngologists study the parts of the voice, but really the only thing that they ever practice on and really are skilled at is just trying to take broken things and make them simulate something that looks like it might function. It's not about understanding the difference between what happens in the anatomy of a high use singer, and if you are on worship team, even if you're not a leader, three times a month or more, 
you are a high use singer. You're actually using that vocal machine as much as an average touring artist. Not the big, big top 10%, but the rest of them that go around and tour the country. You're actually using your vocal machine that much. That's a super high amount of use for those muscles in your body. I learned that otolaryngologists never study anything that gives them any other information to decipher a, like a couch potato voice from an Olympic level need voice. Because if you think about athletes, if you're a couch potato and you want to get some exercise and you get a coach, what they're going to give you is going to be completely different than if you are trying to qualify for the Olympics in a specific sport. If you need a coach for that, I mean, it's like, duh, one versus the other. Yet our doctors that have their degrees, because there are so few singers with high need voices, according to them, and that means so few paying patients with the amount of money to make a difference for them to do the studies and all of that, there is never any training that takes the difference in those voices into consideration. But the differences in the needs for those two levels of activity for this muscle are vast. The opportunity I had to get in and talk to Dr. Sean Nassari, Beverly Hills, is not a once in a lifetime. It's like a once in 50 lifetimes opportunity. It just doesn't happen. He's full-time booked by the top of the top of the top. You just don't get in to see him. But like I said, my coach felt really bad because he didn't know what to do. Just so happened I had to be in LA anyway. My daughter was participating in this big showcase of talent at Disneyland for international and national homeschool kids. So I, we were going down for that. I was still in a wheelchair at the time because I didn't have all my muscle back in the rest of my body. But he opened a time for me on that weekend. I flew in two days early and I went to Beverly Hills to see Dr. Nassari with my two brains. The one that was just devastated that I couldn't sing again that I would not be able to make sound, that I had just had all of this revelation. I just learned all of these things. Luckily, I'd made all the videos for vocal mastery, but I didn't know if I'd ever be able to help singers or even sing again. And then there was my other brain, that obsessive questioning brain that was like, oh, I get to take my three ring binders worth of things that I've learned, stuff that I put into vocal mastery, stuff that I couldn't figure out any other way, but the really unique opportunities I got the first time. And I get to go to the guy, the guy in existence today and ask him if I'm right. Who gets that chance? So I was either really excited for this trip or really mad and depressed, <laughs> depending on the moment. I really liked Dr. Nassari. I'm not a fan of doctors. I've had a lot of disappointing situations with doctors, and I find a lot of them not to have bedside matter. But Dr. Nassari has to put up with a lot of really high-end tough characters, singers. So um, it was a really, really great guy to spend some time with. He was really gracious to spend about two-thirds of the time answering my questions about everything I'd learned. I couldn't talk, of course, I couldn't make sound, so I had this giant dry erase board, and I would write as fast as I could. I would say, I did this because that, and this happened, and I think because of this, breath support is not a scientifically founded concept. I think posture is blown out of the water. I think it's not a necessary element to make sound or for the voice to do what it needs to do to excel. And I would say, what do you think? And I just kept writing and handing it to him and over and over and he'd go, yeah, absolutely. No, nope, that's what the science teaches. No, nope, absolutely. Most doctors never study this, but I've studied it for, you know, decades. And this is what I find in singers. And he would tell me stories and they would say, well, we haven't had a chance to study that because nobody's going to go through as much vocal damage as you have. But that's fascinating. And that makes sense. That lines up with everything I've learned as a vocal specialist. And I was like, ah. Oh. This is so great. I was having such a good time. I almost forgot we, what we were there for. The video stroboscopy. The camera down the throat. So I went through another one and everything got very quiet. He pulled up a chair and sat down and explained to me that there was no surgery that could repair this. Remember when I told you our vocal cords when they're open are thick and short and as they zip up and close they thin for the high notes then they shorten and thicken as we go down to our low notes. Well, when they sliced through this vocal cord all the way through the supporting muscle, which makes this thing move, all of a sudden I, I can't do this. I can only do this. And this can't move. And if we can't get this bugger up, we don't have the resistance against air 
which is what makes sound. It's not the air. Air is a small, small part. It's like a kazoo. The resistance of the air against the tissue paper on the kazoo is actually what creates the sound. So because that muscle was so damaged, and even when it healed, it would have a deep, very wide margin of scar tissue, which would continue to pull on the vocal cord and continue to make it do this when it tried to do this. And if we can't get them to go here, we have no resistance against air, we have no sound. He said, it's true, there's no speech therapy for this. I mean, they can try to help you make some sounds, but you're already doing better on your own. But the best you can hope for is to have a low gravel of a sound. You might be able to get it good enough so that your family kind of recognizes your voice, but you will never speak normally again. You will never sing normally again, and you will never do either professionally again. But then he ended it with, but look what you did the first time. See what you can figure out the second time. <laughs> and I was devastated. Again, there was no reason in the world for me not to give up. There was no hope. But then something else completely out of nowhere and amazing happened. And that changed everything again. 